Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Whispering Hope Daily Lesson Study Review here with us. This week, we are studying the seal of God and the map of the beast, part two. And our topic for this morning is the deadly wound. But before we go into our discussion, we'll invite Ella Jarvis to do our prayer, and then Ella Thomas will read for us our memory text. Let us pray, loving Father, we thank you so much for yet another opportunity where we can sit before your throne, we, we be taught by your spirit, give us insight, give us wisdom, give us understanding, forgive us of our sins, grant us from unrighteousness, and may these moments be a blessing in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And our memory text comes from Revelation 13 and verse 10 from the New King James Version, it reads, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Amen, amen. We're going to begin with our insights and our main points that we get from our memory text this morning. For our text this week, we'll begin with Ella Jarvis and then Elder Thomas will come right after. What are the main points that stand out to you from our memory text? Well, they, it basically brings back to memory the passage that says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yes, and you know that faithful say, saying, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And that's also, you know, come back to mind. Here is something that you find today. People would say it's karma. They would say it's karma when, you know, you, you do something and then you get back the same thing. But here we're looking at something in prophecy that is spoken. And so that we could identify, have, you know, a little more information to identify who exactly the prophecies are talking about. Amen, amen, indeed. So looking at our topic for this morning, our topic is the deadly wound. What comes to your mind? What, in the context of our lesson this week, which speaks of the seal of God and the mark of the beast, what is our understanding? What is your understanding of our topic this morning? We'll begin with, Elder Jarvis again, and then Elder Thomas will wrap that up for us. The deadly wound. Now, we understand that this was a uh, uh, prophetic utterance where it was foretold that this mammoth system would, at some point in time, would not have the power and authority that she once had it would be taken away and the reason that it had to happen is because as old people would say god don't wear pajamas you know you can uh, you can do as you like but not for as long as you like and it had the it wielded without care, without mercy, it's power and authority over, over the kingdoms of men. And it's interesting because we have to remember that it has three sides. It, ha it has a religious side, it has a political side, and it is also ec an economic powerhouse. And the, its religious side really held sway. And it's political side was he was chief so the time came and it was orchestrated so that its own power deceived it and gave its power to something else and napoleon and the french they thought okay they were done with this system this this pope and church down with the whole gang and the Berthier went, took the Pope off his throne, and we know that is the ending of the time, time and half a time, the 1798 period. And here's where the deadly wound was inflicted. But the, the importance of the wound was the false church had to move out of the way 
so that the true church and truth, light, righteousness could come to the surface where all of humanity would benefit from that which was to happen. Yes, just to add a little bit to what Elder Jarvis has said here is that when you hear about deadly wound, it suggests that almost fatal uh, somebody who would receive a deadly wound, it was intended to totally kill or to destroy. But as we go further, we understand that it was healed. Uh, and yes, at the point in time, when according to the events that was uh, set in place this great power that was uh, ruling the world as the Jarvis rightly said political it was religious and it had economic power napoleon wanted like like hitler wanted to rule the world and so they you definitely would go after who is basically ruling the world to destroy that power so that you could rule the world and so Napoleon recognized that uh, in order to rule the world, he would need to take charge of this power, put down this power, so that he could rule. And that deadly wound was inflicted. Yes, Bertier took the Pope off his throne, and he died in prison. And so the, the church at the time was not able to continue to rule like it had. Well, it went on the ground for a while. But yes, the other church got to flourish, the truth got to come out. And but we're dealing with a time when that wound would be healed again. But that deadly wound was inflicted at that particular time at the end of the of the prophecy, the twelve hundred and sixty days we'll discuss a little later. Amen, amen. So we're gonna turn into our Bibles. So we'll ask Elder Jarvis to turn to Revelation thirty five. And Daniel seven twenty five, and then Elder Thomas will turn to Revelation chapter twelve, and you will read for us verses six and fourteen, and after which we'll come with our question. Revelation thirteen and verse five. I'm reading from the King James version. It says, "And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies." And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Daniel 7 and verse 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of time. And Revelation 12 and verse 6 says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And verse 14 says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for time and time and half a time from the face of the serpent. All right, so looking at this text, we're going to begin with Elder Thomas this time around, and then Elder Jarvis will come after and tell us if he agrees. How long would this power dominate the religious landscape in the previous centuries? All right, so the text says that it was, in one part, it says 1260 days, another section it says time and times and the dividing of times and in another place it says 42 months we recognize that these times are the same uh, time times time is one year times two years that's three years and half a time three and a half years when you look at look at the 42 months it calculates to the same using 30 days per month but in prophetic time it really comes down to 1260 years and numbers 14 34 tells us after the number of days in which he searched the land even 40 days each day for a year shall be 
your iniquities even 40 years and ye shall know my breach of promise. And this has been used by those who would have reconciled these prophecies in the past that the principle of a day for a year has been used to come to the times that when you're talking about prophecies and so when we when we look at the time you recognize that it's 1260 years that this power would have ruled it would have started in 538 and it would have ended in 17 98 so it's a, it's quite a, a long period of time but history would indicate that yes the the roman church after taking over from the roman empire would have ruled for 1260 years and so we can we can definitely um, recognize time period and what power we're talking about i'll allow Ella Jarvis to add to that there isn't really much to add the, the the fact is that this system and interesting thing is that Ro pagan rome ruled for 653 years and then it changed it became something else where it was no longer just a political system political rulership political government but it was now a religious religio-political uh, entity where the one who sits as emperor was also declared to be the head of all religions and that it is that particular point where we the, the passages reference the uh, persecution of god's people and how long these are going to rule from that's that particular time that it was marked at 538 BC. But persecution was going on. The prophetic writer indicated that persecution began on the Nero just about at the martyrdom of Paul, and that was 70, 70 AD. And, you know, for almost 400 years, persecution played up and died down, played up, died down around 300 under this guy by the name of Diocletian who was apparently more horrible than Nero himself it but it is to mark the this system which seeks to stand in the place of God at and that system ruled from 538 down to 1798 that 42 months time time and half a time that was spoken about Amen, amen. So, uh, question number two says, in part one of this study, we discovered that in Revelation 13, 3, the beast received a deadly wound that coincided with the 1,260 days. What is the deadly wound and could you elaborate? While elaborating, we would like you to utilize, and you could turn to that for your reference, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. And we'll begin with Elder Thomas, and then Elder Jarvis will come right after. I think we would have basically answered that question, but if you want to go back a bit at it, uh, the, the deadly wound, as we recognized earlier, was actually taking the the head of the church at the time the pope out of his off of his seat and causing that power to to lose it wasn't <laughs> like like today we have elections and and you move people and you replace and so forth he was captured by napoleon and taken into captivity and, and so the church would have lost its power at that time that is when the deadly wound was inflicted 1798 according to the prophecies the 1260 years would have ended 
that this power would have ruled. And again, Numbers 14 and verse 34 uh, gives us the time period uh, as how you calculate the prophetic time, because it would have mentioned 1260 days. But when you check history, 1260 days would not have come to, to this point. You could not really fit any power in that period of time if you're talking about literal days. And so you would be confused as to who it's the prophecy is referring to. But when you use the principle to calculate prophetic time as a, a day for a year, then you can see how it fits perfectly with this power that ruled for that particular time. And we would have mentioned already the time in which it, it was that this power ruled. Okay, well, I want to look at the, the other aspect of the deadly wound. It, because it was not only the removal of the political authority, but it was also the removal of the religious authority. We know that the Dark Ages were considered to be some of the gruel, gruesome periods within Earth's history. Between 50 to 100 million individuals were murdered for the faith. The, it was out, the Bible was outlawed and it was on the pain of death where that you were caught with a piece of it or memorizing scripture. That, that sort of thing was totally outlawed. And it was done so, so that people could be kept in darkness. And when the deadly wound was inflicted, the false church moved into the wilderness and the true church came out of the wilderness. The fact is, the two systems cannot live in the same place at the same time. So let's think about when the Bible refers to, and the deadly wound was healed, what that really means. That it is the false church reclaiming the position that she held, one of prominence, one of dominance, one of control, and the true church now moves back into the wilderness where people are being persecuted for their faith, where people are being marginalized, where they're going to be affected adversely because that two churches cannot live in the same place. So this is just, this is the religious aspect of the deadly wound where the false church, she was displaced so that the true church and truth can come to the surface, come to the light, where all men can get to know the word of God for themselves and make decisions accordingly. Amen, amen. So, continuing with our discussion. Now, we uh, should think about how amazing biblical prophecy is and how it reveals to us God's knowledge of future events. Now, what should this fact teach us about why we can trust the Lord's promises, even the ones we don't see fulfilled? And we begin with Elder Thomas again, and then we'll come back to Elder Thomas. We recognize that, you know, in, in our lives and in, when you look at the history of the world, and even when you consider idea of of evolution uh, there's no prophecy in in evolution there's no prophecy in in um you know so many different areas um the quran we told that there are no prophecies there but when you look at the bible that we identify as god's words we see so many prophecies and in history we could we recognize the fulfillment of every prophetic message that was given for its time and even for our time and what that does is it brings us to a place where we recognize that we can definitely trust the word of god and you know go back to texts like uh, matthew 6 and verse 20 33 that says but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you so when we think about our future when we think about our lives as it were it's ordained by god if we allow god to direct our path 
then we can trust that God is going to lead us in the path of righteousness because what we would have seen in prophetic time and what we would have seen in history that God knows the end from the beginning. That's what the word says. And we can trust it because we see it time and time again. And uh, I think that brings us to a point of recognizing that if all that was prophesied before that has gone, that has happened, it means that the remaining portion of prophecy will happen. And it tells us that we now just need to be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ because he's coming again. It was prophesied that he would come the first time. He prophesied that these things would happen before he returns. And definitely as we see them happen, we know that he will return. So it gives us the hope that we can prepare. The time that we have now is to prepare for his soon return. I just want to look, first look at a few passages. Verses, Isaiah 41, verses 22 and 23, the Bible says, Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things and what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods, yea, do good and do or do evil that we may be dismayed or behold and behold it together. God is challenging those who claim that they are God. He says, show the things that are to come that we may know that you are God. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old? For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God says, that's how you know me because I can, I'm telling you what's going to happen. And as I tell you, that's exactly how it's going to happen. We know Amos chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God would do nothing but reveal it his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. But here's what Jesus said in the book of John. And this is quite eye-opening. John chapter 13 and verse 19, Jesus said, Now I tell you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. And John 14, 29 says, he says again, and now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it comes to pass, ye might believe. Only God knows that which is to come. And only the true God can give a prophetic utterance because no one else, no other one who they is claimed to be God can tell you anything that is to happen. Not even the devil can. So we can trust that everything that God says, and if he says 1260 years, it's exactly that. If it's 40 days and 40 nights, it's exactly that. Because he is God and he knows all things and we can trust him no matter what. Amen, amen. Now we're coming down to the end of our discussion. Now, our last question says to us, the longest time prophecy ended in 1844. And remember, we remember that from different studies in church. Now, how should that impact our preparation for Jesus' return? We're going to begin with Elder Jarvis this time around. And then Elder Thomas will come right after. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, Jesus has been coming back for a long time and he's not here yet. They've always heard he's coming. <laughs> and doesn't appear that he's coming. There, there are even groups of people who indicated that he's actually not coming back because of what he got the last time he came. He's not coming back to get any more of that. <laughs> you know, but these are people who really don't believe the word of God as 
as being authoritative, as being authentic, as being true. Because if they knew what we know, then it's not a matter of him coming in a time when I will see him come. It's him coming, and as long as he said he's going to come, we will know that he's he will come. I think that's really what we just established. Everything that he says will happen, will happen. And it's not a matter of it happening within the time that we, the, the minute time that we have been on earth, little 60 years, 75 years that we live. That means nothing. That's, that's, a, that's a speck in the line of time that the earth exists. So really we need to, as David said, and be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Uh, be ready for our next awakening moment or for if he should come in our lifetime. But he will come and will not tarry. Yes, you know, in interestingly, too, we look at the longest time period in prophecy given, but we were not told how long the time after that would be. So, so we really don't have no clue whether the time after that would be longer or shorter. <laughs> Nevertheless, still, you know, we are told that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. And if you use that principle, just for argument's sake, it's only two days since Jesus would have left by now. It's just, about, just two days. <laughs> so it's really not a long time. So we, the thing is, though, is that, um, like Elder Jarvis says, however short our lives might be, it's the time period that we have been given to prepare to be a part of the kingdom of God and a kingdom that would last for for eternity. There would be no more time, neither prophetic or otherwise. There would be no more time in terms of a limit to, to life. Life would be limitless. And so what time we have been given now, we have been given the opportunity to choose the path that leads to eternal life, which is through Jesus Christ, so that we might have everlasting life. Amen, amen. Now, we'll come to the end of our lesson, but we cannot leave without our takeaways. Now, this was a very powerful lesson this morning. So I'm sure you have many takeaways that you could walk with, but we only want one. So we're going to begin with Ella Jarvis and Ella Thomas. We're going to come back to you. What is your takeaway from our lesson this morning? Well, really, what is coming into my view is the question, if I am alive, will I be ready for when the deadly wound is healed? Will I be ready for when things get, get difficult? Will I be ready for the testing because of my faith? Or am I going to give up my faith because I need to choose something that is easier to accept? May we contemplate those things as we live from day to day. I would say uh, my takeaway is recognizing that, that God is very specific in terms of what he says that he will do. What he says will happen, will happen exactly as he said that it will happen. And so it gives me faith to trust God uh, for the rest of the future, the unknown future to us is known to God. And for me, we can rely on the word of God just trust God. So that's the point that I, I come away with. God is particular. We can trust him because he's exact. Whatever he says, that is exactly what will happen. Amen, amen. And that has brought us to the end of our discussion this morning. Our topic for our lesson tomorrow is the falling away. We Hope that you don't miss it, that you share the link with the family, that you share the link with a friend, and that you continue to join us every morning, 6 a.m., as we continue to study together.